whose books include movie comics, page to screen, screen to page, comic book movies, and the forthcoming comic book women, characters, creators, and culture in the golden age, which is co-written by a DePaul alum, Peyton Burnett. So now, um, without further ado, I will turn it over. Thank you so much. I'm just going to uh, turn my screen share on here and get this queued up. There we go. Um, welcome. Thanks for coming out and thanks for uh, taking an interest in Marvel, which I know seems to be everywhere these days, uh, including at the Museum of Science and Industry, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit. What I want to do today is uh, tying into uh, this event that's at the MSI right now. Oh, actually, hang on. I have this on auto. I'll have to do this manually. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Marvel in the larger context of the history of the publishing company uh, and many of the characters as well. Um, I want to tie this into the evolution of cinema and television starting all the way back in the um, early 1940s because they've had a very long history. But I also want to tie this to uh, many of the cultural transitions and some of the issues of representation of identity, which has gone through uh, many ups and downs over uh, the last uh, eight decades of Marvel. A little bit about who I am. I teach in the College of Communication. I teach media and cinema studies. And I've done a lot of work um, in the last few years around comic books and comic book movies, adaptations of comics. And my book, Movie Comics, really um, goes back to the history of both media and the relationship between uh, cinema and comic books, which really developed simultaneously as media, um, starting in 1895 with uh, the very first films that were publicly projected. And 1895 was also the same year as uh, a strip called Hogan's Alley, the first newspaper uh, comic strip. And so those two media had a, a back and forth relationship that developed over the decades with um, adaptations going both ways. There were comic books that adapted movies just as movies would adapt comic strips and later comic books. And so I've done a lot of work on comic book cinema. Uh, my newest book is tracing uh, an early feminist um, revisionist history of how comics got their start in the 1930s, 40s and 50s and really trying to um, make a better case for the role played by women as creators who played uh, some pivotal and unheralded, uh, uncredited roles within the industry as uh, writers and artists and editors, but also um, retracing many of the um, female and also non-binary characters who um, really haven't had uh, that much attention paid to their pivotal roles uh, within how different genres developed within uh, the comic book industry. I've written uh, for publications like the Washington Post about comics, uh, for Ms. Magazine about comic book movies. I've been um, part of what's called the Comic Studies Society. So there's actually an academic uh, society dedicated to the study of comics, and there's a journal involved that I'm on the board with. I even, um, I, I study B-movies as well, and I got to appear on two episodes of an AMC show uh, starring James Cameron, which was a lot of fun to be able to talk about these low-budget uh, films as well. And then I was able to be part of the, uh, the launch of the Marvel Universe of Superheroes exhibit at the Museum of Science and Industry, which is uh, a lot of fun as well. I highly recommend that you get there. Um, comics have not always been taken as seriously, but now uh, they are literally uh, studied and, and presented within museums as well. So I mentioned the Comic Studies Society, and there's been this sort of, of growth in the last, really I wanna say 20 years of comic studies as a field of academic study. I teach uh, a course uh, several times a year uh, called Comic Studies within the College of Communication in which we trace some of the, the literary and, and media aspects of how uh, comics work and how they represent identity. And so we take them seriously as an art form, as a medium, and also as a, an aspect of culture and how representation functions. And then again, like I say, this sort of new seriousness translate into um, academic journals like Inks, which I'm on the, um, the editorial board of. And then again, you've been able to, to have them in art galleries, have them in museums now in a way that really wasn't conceivable 20, 30, 40 years ago when I started reading and paying attention um, to comics. 
And so I want to trace a little bit of the history of how Marvel got its start. And it really stems out of the 1930s as the, the birth of the comic book industry in which you had uh, the comic book as a publishing format uh, emerge. There were, you know, other aspects of what comics were in prior decades, and there were, you know, editorial political cartoons uh, for, you know, at least 100 years prior in, um, you know, various uh, magazines and, and newspapers. Um, but the, the what we know today is the comic book got its start in the 1930s with this book called Funnies on Parade, which was given out as as a giveaway. Uh, when you would buy certain uh, products, they had this giveaway that they would uh, give you and it would reprint various newspaper strips and it was sold as a way of getting you to buy that extra thing. But it was so successful and so popular that a company decided to make this a regular thing and publish an ongoing title called Famous Funnies. But again, they were just collections of existing newspaper strips that had already been published, but which you know weren't republished anywhere. It was there one day in the newspaper and then it was gone unless you clipped it and saved it and put it in your scrapbook. And so you had a collection of, of well-known popular newspaper strips like um, Mutt and Jeff is uh, one that you see here on the front, which was quite popular. And other uh, later collections would reprint things like Dick Tracy and Little Orphan Annie. And it became so popular that, that publishers realize that, hey, there's actually a market for this type of publication. And with that, there were other um, publishers, such as what became known as DC Comics eventually, started off as a, a company called National Allied Publications, that began to realize, well, what if we produced original content and not just reprinted things that had already been in newspapers. And so the early publishers that uh, went on to become DC Comics um, created a title called New Fun. And they would have a, a new series such as Sandra of the Secret Service, who was a female detective type character who was the lead uh, feature in each uh, week. New Fun was eventually replaced uh, after several issues by More Fun. Not sure why they decided to uh, change it, but I guess uh, once the fun is not new anymore, they decided that you can have more fun. Um, and then eventually uh, DC Comics went on to um, produce things like Action Comics and Batman. Um, but it's, it's worth noting that, of course, comics had been around for uh, several decades, uh, even a century prior. There were some occasional types of reprints. So this idea of what we think of as the comic book, I mean, this uh, uh, type of thing, here, which is floppy and it's you know thin and it's 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 only about 30 pages that was uh, a, a new development in what comics already had been in other existing forms you see here some early collections which were hardcover bound of mutton jeff was one of the most popular comic strips uh the the yellow kid from hogan's alley was collected he was the most popular character breaking up father the brownies the funnies was even an oversized much bigger than a comic book format, attempting to reprint newspaper strips. It didn't last for very long, but it came about in 1930. So there were all these other sort of attempts at coming up with a, a collection or something you could hold in your hands, collecting together um, comic strips. But it never really quite took until this comic book format came along. It's worth noting, of course, that comics were in all sorts of other formats. These are pulp magazines, what we think of as pulp fiction. Uh, you think of uh, weird adventure stories or amazing stories and those well-known pulp magazines. Uh, this was actually uh, a line of spicy, um, which meant sort of salacious or, or lurid, in other words, types of genre-based uh, pulps from uh, one of the um, founders of DC Comics, Harry Donenfeld, who had a line of spicy detective and mystery and West Western stories that really were uh, along the lines of softcore pornography for their day and were actually the, the subject of numerous lawsuits for just how salacious they were. And there were uh, comic characters in them that uh, were, they had two or three page strips with um, characters that were in line with each of the, the genres. So there was a detective character called Sally the Sleuth, for example, in Spicy Detective, who would get into all sorts of different scenarios where she was trying to solve crime, but would get into trouble. 
and often ended up in various states of undress. And actually there was nudity in these uh, pulp magazines, which is why I say that they're very sort of softcore and pornographic. And they were, there was a trend that you'll notice coming up in even some of the Marvel comics of really sort of, of lurid, uh, often quite sexist types of images that placed women in various states of undress and also placed women in, in peril in various sorts of, of dangerous situations. And so the origins of comics um, are very sort of, of lurid, very sort of, of controversial when we look at some of the early patterns of how uh, different identities were, were represented. And so Harry Donenfeld was one of the uh, founders of the DC Comics, but of course got his start with this pulp uh, magazine. Another publisher was Martin Goodman, who also was a pulp magazine publisher and uh, had a series of pulp magazines called Marvel Tales, Marvel Science Stories. He did not actually have uh, comic uh, strips or characters within his particular pulps, but uh, you can see that he liked the name Marvel so much that he decided to do something else with it along the way. But again here, note the uh, the pattern of, of women tied up. You have a lot of bondage type imagery with uh, chains, often women tied up with ropes. And there's, for some reason with Marvel, there are a lot of women in glass tubes. I don't know why, but I guess that was a popular uh, visual pattern at the time that sold a lot of covers. So you see that over and over again in the Marvel pulps. And 1938 comes along and uh, DC Comics has the success with Action Comics with the rise of Superman. The next year they have success with Detective Comics introducing the character of Batman. So in 1939, Martin Goodman in this uh, pulp magazine publishing world where everybody knows each other, sees the trends that are emerging, decides that he wants in on uh, this new comic book uh, marketplace and get some of the money that is being generated from that. And so forms the company called Timely Comics, which is the originator of what eventually became the company known as Marvel Comics when they changed their name in the 1960s. And the first title that Martin Goodman published was called Marvel Comics, because of course he has this brand from the pulp uh, magazines of Marvel, and the word conj conjures up the idea of marvelousness or uh, something that is, is fantastic, that is a, you know one of the uh, wonders or marvels of the world, so to speak. So it has that kind of uh, sensationalistic type of title that would uh, uh, hopefully draw in younger readers. And, and so, it uh, uh, is the new birth of, of Marvel as the, the company that we know today. Uh, it just so happens that they named the very first uh, comic book after this Marvel title that they had from the, uh, the pulp. So when they decided to rebrand in the 1960s, there is this sort of, of legacy uh, involved with the names that were used in the various stages of the, of the publishing empire. Now, what's also really interesting about how Marvel Comics got their start is that Martin Goodman, the publisher, uh, actually sort of farmed out how he put together the content for the first issue. Um, there was a company called Funnies Inc., Funnies Incorporated, which was uh, owned by a couple named Lloyd and Grace Jacquet, if I'm pronouncing that right. It's either Jacket or Jacquet. I can't remember how they stressed uh, the name, but they had a shop in which they would um, create content for other publishers that wanted to put together a particular comic book. And so Funnies Inc. would create various stories and then shop them around and say, do you want to buy this character? What do you think of that character? Do you want to put this in your new comic book? And had content that eventually was then sold to Martin Goodman and put in the first issue of Marvel Comics. And this was a character called the Submariner that you might be familiar with if you're a Marvel fan. Uh, Prince Neymar, the Submariner, has uh, been in the cartoons, hasn't yet made it into uh, the MCU, but is a very popular, well-known character within the Marvel Universe. And he was uh, one of the stars of Marvel Comics number one, but it wasn't quite his first appearance of all things. Uh, the Submariner also appeared in a, another promotional comic that was meant as a free giveaway called Motion Picture Funnies Weekly. And this was a very short-lived attempt at creating comic books for movie theaters in which it was hoped that uh, in order to draw younger uh, viewers to the theater every week or every month, that there would be a free giveaway that they would be able to go to the theater to buy. 
the content really had nothing to do with movies whatsoever, but uh, it was just a, a free giveaway because that is another forum of how comics were, were given. There were a lot of, of free types of, of uh, comics that were given out with various products and movie exhibition was just one of them. And so the Submariner actually appeared in Motion Picture Funnies Weekly and then the series went nowhere and died and they decided to stop doing that as a, as a giveaway but lloyd uh, jacket still had this content and thought well maybe we can still sell this and then approached martin goodman when he was in uh, the market for content they actually ended up expanding the number of pages in the story added new art to the story in order to um, make it fit the needs of martin goodman's marvel comics number one and so the submariners first appearance uh, wasn't quite marvel comics number one it was motion picture funnies weekly and then um lloyd and grace uh, jacquet sold his story, which was exactly the same art as you can find in that motion picture with uh, new heroes like the Human Torch, but not the one from the Fantastic Four. We'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, there was a character, a superhero called the Angel. There was a range of different genres because comics at this time usually didn't just specialize in one genre they would give you a range of different heroes in different genres sort of something for everybody approach so there were western stories alongside action heroes and superheroes there was a character called the masked raider who was like a lone ranger type of character there was a jungle adventurer called kazar and so all of these were sold to martin goodman to put together in this package from this packaging shop known as as funny zinc <clears throat> and as marvel started going there were they added new series uh, marvel comics uh, continued there was uh, something i believe called daring mystery stories uh and one of the, the characters that they introduced was actually marvel's first female superhero it was known as the silver scorpion uh, from daring comics and she only, I believe, had two appearances. So she's very uh, little remembered, didn't really go anywhere, hasn't really been um, brought back very much in the decades that followed, but she is historically important. She's the first female superhero at Marvel. It's debatable whether she actually has any superpowers. Within comic circles, you get into all sorts of fights about, oh, if they don't have superpowers, are they actually a superhero? Or are they a, a masked, caped adventurer? It's complicated, I guess. And sometimes I have the energy for these fights and sometimes I don't, but I call her a superhero because she fights crime and she wears a cape and she has a mask on. She is uh, trained in judo. So she has a, sight, a heightened set of skills and she beats up bad guys. And that's good enough for me when we define what superheroes are. So she is uh, quite historically important, but not that well remembered unfortunately. And she's one of the characters that I write about in my new book, Comic Book Women, as I try to retrace the history that has been forgotten in favor of these, these male heroes and these male creators. There was actually a character called the Black Widow. Well before that other Black Widow came along. Um, one of the things that uh, also doesn't get told very much is that Stan Lee sometimes was a little bit lazy in how he would uh, come up with character names and he would reuse a lot of characters from before that were around in other variations. There was a Doctor Doom before he came up with his other Doctor Doom. Um, Black Widow, for example, she was a villain. She was not a superhero. She was actually a servant of Satan there were a lot of servants of Satan in the 1940s. He was a, a popular uh, big boss figure as a villain and he would uh, command. There were a number of different women and also male characters that sort of did his bidding, I suppose, in the 1940s. And the Black Widow was uh, just one of them. So there were a lot of sort of very powerful female figures at this time. There were other female figures that were a little bit more complicated when it comes to identity politics and how they were um, uh, represented. This is a character called Golden Girl, who I do hope that they do something with in the MCU and they introduce her in some capacity, if only to correct how her debut took place. She was a, a new female sort of sidekick or partner to Captain America in the 1940s. At one point, Bucky Barnes um, hurt himself and they decided to put him on the sidelines and introduce a new female character called Golden Girl, uh, named Betsy Ross because she has a very patriotic name. But uh, the problem with this is when 
Cap decides to use her as his new partner, he first decides to audition her or interview her and arrives at her home to ask her about her background and her training. But when she, when Cap knocks on the door, I want to talk to you. Well, what's wrong? You see her wearing an apron and you see her literally doing the dishes while Cap sits and interviews her. Can we talk while I'm finishing the dishes? What do you want? Well, I want to ask you a few questions. You ever go in for athletics at school? And so she is here holding up a dish as she is washing during this interview with Cap to become his partner. I don't think Bucky ever had to go through uh, these types of, of really sort of overtly hyper-feminized leaps and bounds. And then it gets even more problematic. This is the end of the first story. They solve the case and they defeat the villain. And uh, Golden Girl gets uh, a little ahead of herself and tries to go in to give Cap a hug. Cap says, that's no way for a seasoned crime fighter to ask on second thought. This is something I've always wanted to do and leans into it. It is problematic in a, a lot of ways as far as how this uh, first appearance of this important female character is used to reinforce these 1940s gender norms. And so I, I sort of trace this problematic history throughout the book that you've got a lot of firsts at Marvel, but a lot of the time they are um, problematic in how they are handled given the way that uh, representations of identity functioned in this era. But there were a lot of women that also don't uh, get a lot of their, their due at Marvel, uh, including some of the non-superpowered characters uh, like Patsy Walker and like Millie the Model. Eventually, they rebranded Patsy Walker as a superhero in later decades, and she is now the character that you might know as Hellcat, who um, appeared in the uh, Jessica Jones Netflix Marvel series. But initially, she was a, a teenage character and uh, there was another uh, famous character called Millie the Model, and they had uh, multi-decade runs at Marvel. I'm going to talk about that they were even more important to the origins of the superheroes later on in the 60s in ways that people haven't really recognized. And in some ways, Patsy Walker and Millie the Model actually saved Marvel when they were at a low point in their publishing industry. But I'll get to that in uh, just a little bit. It's important to realize how Marvel represented women and young teenage girls uh, throughout the 40s and 50s in ways that were often very stereotypical. Um, even worse, however, is the way that characters of color have been presented. In particular, African-American characters at Marvel um, had to go through some development in order to get to the point where you had a very very progressive character like Black Panther in the 1940s, created by uh, Jack Kirby and Stan Lee. But Stan Lee uh, began writing characters of color with uh, the figure of Whitewash Jones, who was a young teenage character in a book called The Young Allies, which features uh, Bucky Barnes, the young uh, psychic Toro of the Human Torch, and uh, a bunch of other neighborhood uh, type of kids who go after bad guys like the Red Skull. But then you've got Whitewash Jones, who is uh, really uh, a problematic figure both in how he was drawn stereotypically and also in the, the dialogue that they would use to characterize him with. Um, multiple times you see here, they talk about um, him in relation to uh, watermelons. You see here in one of the panels, you see here in one of the ads. This was Stan Lee's doing. Stan Lee wrote the script and the character. So Stan Lee um, did have a lot to make up for by the time we got into the 1960s when he co-created a character like um, uh, Black Panther, for example. In addition to Whitewash Jones in the 1940s, moving through uh, the history of Black characters at Marvel, you had a character called Waku, Prince of the Bantu, in a book called Jungle Tales, which really is one of the only heroic figures that we can point to amongst Black characters at Marvel in uh, the 1940s and 50s and even almost into the early 1960s. You've got a jungle-based hero like Waku who um, falls into some of these colonialist, colonialist stereotypes, unfortunately, in this very short-lived series. So the Jungle uh, series was one of a number of genres that were experimented with throughout the 40s and the 50s, and many times the characters uh, like Waku were handled in very problematic ways. 
as you move into the 1950s at Marvel, uh, you continue with books like uh, Jungle Tales. And really what we see by the early 1950s is a decline of the superhero. Superheroes were very popular in the late 30s and well into the 1940s, but some people don't realize that there was a time in which superheroes were not the most popular genre by far. Uh, the number of superhero titles uh, declined by the 1940s. People stopped publishing them as readers started to lose interest because the market had been flooded with different types of characters. And they introduced Westerns and horror and romance so that people had a range of different types of genres to, to choose from. But uh, with more uh, variety came more uh, sort of attention paid, and there was a lot of critique of uh, the comic book industry by a uh, psychiatrist of all things named Frederick Wortham, who wrote a book called Seduction of the Innocent in 1954, and also testified before the U.S. Senate, who were really concerned about juvenile delinquency and the role of comic books that might be playing a role therein with crime comics and horror comics perhaps corrupting the morals of our nation's youth and senators debated and called forth uh, people from the industry and, and you know, cultural critics to testify and brought forth uh, the, the evidence so to speak to, to show that there should be some sort of censorship involved in comics which actually did lead to a form of industry self-censorship. There was uh, the need for the comics industry to sort of clean up its own house, they felt, amongst themselves. So they uh, decided to create what was known as the Comics Code Authority, which was in existence for many, many decades and had certain standards for what you could and could not include. Um, they were particularly focused on crime and horror and sexuality. And you see here an example of changes that were required to tone down uh, some of the luridness of uh, the images that were, that were present in many of these types of books. Um, <clears throat> so what happens is if you've got this change in genres that, uh, that takes place, and with that, uh, a lot of publishers start to, to uh, drop the number of titles that they're publishing, Marvel uh, in included. There was scrutiny within the industry. Parents were, were looking at this as something they didn't want to buy for their children as much anymore. Uh, horror had to change to sort of supernatural and, and strangeness. And with this change in the 1950s and this sort of more fragile type of, of industry and, and marketplace conditions, Martin Goodwin at Marvel decided that it was the right time for him to switch uh, distributors. He had created this uh, network known as Atlas Comics and created a bunch of smaller corporations to move things around for tax purposes. But uh, his distribution, he thought, might benefit from being able to uh, switch to a new distributor. So he joined something called American News Distribution to save money in and around 1957. But unfortunately, several months later, uh, American News Distribution went under and he was without a distributor all of a sudden. And so he had no choice but to turn to a company um, called Independent News, which just happened to be the parent company of DC Comics. So all of a sudden, Marvel Comics has to essentially be distributed by DC's uh, corporation. And DC, of course, was trying to protect its own interests and didn't want heady competition from Marvel, which was never like the number one publisher at the time, but was you know up there in the top five or so of, of books that sold. And so they put limits on how many titles uh, Timely and Atlas at the time before they became Marvel could publish and said, you can only publish eight titles a month. That's what you've got to work with. And uh, that's uh, what we, we put on place for you for your limits to the market. So... At the time, they weren't sure what to do, decided to rebrand themselves as what we know today as Marvel. For a time, they were actually <laughs> called Marvel Pop Art Production, which I love and, and wish they would bring back. And with that, you see by 1960, they were selling a certain number of copies of Journey into Mystery, which became Thor's title, introduced new titles such as the Fantastic Four, um, really rebranded the, the business around a new line of teenage heroes. That was one of the, the things that I think turned the corner was that they came up with uh, the Fantastic Four, took that old human toy character and recreated him as young teenage Johnny Storm to appeal to the, the teenage readers out there and, and realize that, well, it's not just young kids 
reading these books. It's also, you know, older teenagers and, and college students came up with Spider-Man as a teenage hero, came up with the X-Men as teenage heroes. So it really is a new demographic being targeted and was part of the success, as you see here, that helped them to grow. But initially, we're still limited to those eight titles a month. But what's fascinating to me when we look at what they published was that they didn't let go of some of the staples. And Patsy Walker and Millie the Model, uh, even though they were limited to eight titles a month, were still always there. There was actually three different titles that they often rotated around on a bi-monthly schedule. There was Patsy and Hetty, um, there was Patsy Walker uh, outright, and then there was Millie the Model. So no matter how many new superhero characters they tried to introduce, they still relied upon the bread and butter money that was the, the steady sales of these uh, young women characters, which is again, sort of one of the the, the selling points of uh, what Marvel was able to do to rebrand themselves, they were sort of building off of the, the success of these female characters, which really hasn't been uh, acknowledged that it's not just male superheroes that saved Marvel in the early, early 60s, it was women as well. So when we look at representation, uh, that hasn't been fully addressed. Neither has, you know, as I say, the role of, of heroes of color in uh, the early decades of the comic book industry. Uh, there were a few of them at Marvel, like I say, and those that were um, were highly problematic when we come to a character like Whitewash Jones. But by the 1960s, Stan Lee um, is getting older and is perhaps paying attention to the changes that are going on and the rise of the civil rights movement and introduces a, a character called Gabriel Jones. As you see here, uh, occasionally got his uh, uh, prominent place on the cover, but was part of this sort of ragtag battalion of soldiers and is one of the few times that you see a, a character of color uh, featured in any prominent way on comic book covers. It was very rare to be able to have any sort of images like this. And then, of course, a few years later, um, introducing a character in 1966 like the Black Panther and first in the pages of Fantastic Four and then Jack Kirby eventually gives him in the 1970s his own series. The character went through a lot of changes, of course. A uh, few people know that originally was not going to be called the Black Panther, was going to be called the Coal Tiger, which I think is, is a lot more problematic, but uh, the costume is kind of funky. I suppose you should see here went through various costume changes with the, the half mask versus the full mask. Even as you see here in a, in a panel by the late 1960s and early 70s, changed his name briefly to the Black Leopard. Why you change your name to the Black Leopard? Because the other term has political connotations in your country. Because um, there was no uh, direct attempt to uh, connect the Black Panther to the Black Panther Party, it was um, uh, just a coincidence. But for a while, um, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby and others decided, well, maybe we um, might call him uh, the Black Leopard. It didn't last very long, however. And then a couple of years later, 1969, you have Sam Wilson, one of my absolute favorite characters. I have him hanging on my wall behind me from when I bought uh, his book in 1983, debuted in 1969 as Cap's partner. Some people use the term sidekick. I prefer the term partner. I think his costume has gotten a little better over the years, but he has always been one of my absolute favorite uh, characters. And of course now has become an integral part of the MCU after he has taken over uh, the mantle of Captain America, which they did in the comics in and around uh, 2014. And so are using the source material for uh, the purposes of adapting to the big screen. But now that uh, Sam Wilson is the new Captain America, it's worth mentioning that there were many Captain Americas on screen uh, throughout the history of cinema, but not all of them have been very good and not all of them have even been all that accurate. Uh, this was the first Captain America movie. It was a serial, which is one of those things where you go to the theater once a week and see a 20 minute installment. It was sort of pre-television before television. And there were many uh, popular characters. There was a Superman serial, a Captain Marvel Shazam uh, serial at the time. But Captain America was Marvel's one cinematic excursion in the 1940s. And Martin Goodman was so keen on getting one of his characters on screen that he entered into a deal deal with the, um, the film company Republic Pictures, which specialized in low budget B films and also these chapter play serials and approached Republic and says, I got a character for you. It's Captain America, one of our best sellers. You want the rights? I will sell them to you 
for one dollar. And so Jack Kirby and Joe Simon, the uh, creators of the character, saw no profits off of the sale. We like to think of now as, as uh, char- cre- creators getting their due for what is done with their characters, but the rights were sold for $1. The uh, film then as really just a way to then publicize sales of the comic book. But to that extent, the character was very unlike what we saw in the comic books because he wasn't even... Uh, uh, soldier Steve Rogers. He wasn't Steve Rogers at all in the 1940s. He was a district attorney named Grant Gardner. Why did they make this change? I don't know at all. Maybe it was too expensive to try and go through the war efforts because most of the chapter play serials were about um, people fighting bad guys in warehouses. It was just cheaper to do it that way. So they probably stuck to that template to avoid having to show any war sets at all. He also totes a gun, which Captain America doesn't do but it was it was cinema and it was in the 1940s and fans were just happy to get any type of adaptation it was actually very successful at the time and that was the uh, the first excursion into uh, cinema for marvel in the 1960s there was a new experiment after the superheroes were rebranded and being very popular in comics they sold the rights for cartoons on television a series called marvel uh, superheroes in which you had uh, all of these different heroes of captain america iron man thor hulk and even namor the submariner in their own um, um sort of shorter sort of almost five eight minute installments that they would combine together into a a 30 minute show once a week and sold to stations across the country. I've seen these as a kid. I enjoy them a lot. They are very different looking as far as animation goes, because uh, as you see here at the bottom, exactly as they originally appeared, the animation is uh, really uh, using the original artwork and just adding a little bit of motion to them. So they're not even as animated as a Spider-Man was, for example, which followed. Um, and as Marvel progressed, they adapted series into television, very sort of low budget, very 1970s. But I grew up watching Lou Ferrigno's The Incredible Hulk. And I even have vague memories of Spider-Man in the 70s on television. And I enjoyed them as a fan, as a kid. They were exactly what I wanted. And even if they look kind of, of hokey now, we loved them at the time. I think Captain America hasn't held up as well with the motorcycle helmet. And I don't remember the adaptation of Doctor Strange at all. But the 70s is important for a new brand of heroes that emerged. They introduced a new breed of superheroes who were often um, sort of more uh, street level is the term for it. They were more sort of based in um, uh, everyday reality with also characters of color, such as Shang-Chi, the master of Kung Fu, who has his new MCU film uh, debuting later this summer. I believe. Um, also, uh, Luke Cage, I'll go to that and say Luke Cage is, again, one of my absolute favorite heroes, a real working class character um, based out of the uh, Harlem and the Bronx in his uh, series Hero for Hire and later Power Man. And then there was the first uh, Latinx hero, Hector Ayala, the White Tiger, in a series called Deadly Hands of Kung Fu, which is uh, definitely worth searching out if you're interested uh, in his character. I hope the MCU involves him uh, very soon. He also had uh, some women of color, such as Aurora uh, Monroe, who was Storm. Um, However, a lot of the uh, Black female characters in this era tended to be either part of teams or they were in sort of sidekick roles, such as um, Misty Knight and Colleen Wing in Power Man and Iron Fist. Uh, Compare this with how uh, white women were able to gain their own starring series with uh, characters like Carol Danvers, Ms. Marvel, who is now the new Captain Marvel, and as well um, She-Hulk. So it was white women who were able to gain that prominent spotlight uh, that Black female characters had to wait several years for. Shifting to the 1980s, you had really large mega events in which Marvel is uh, branching out in how they conduct business, quite literally, with big crossover series, the launch of a toy line, which I loved at, uh, at the time, but Look at this, this, this tagline, 
mail action with sales action. I guess it was catchy in the 1980s, but it again really tips off uh, how they envision their readership and who they imagine who these heroes are for. And so in turn, you can imagine how they weren't really thinking about having diversity of heroes. They were just focused on that male uh, demographic. But there were some progressive changes in the 1980s. For example, focusing on legacy heroes by taking existing characters and rebranding them with uh, new heroes taking over the mantle, such as um, uh, Monica Rambeau as Captain Marvel, who's been in the MCU, and also Jim Rhodes as taking over for Iron Man and later becoming the hero War Machine, who you might know from the MCU as well. There were other heroes of color like Roberto da Costa from the New Mutants, as well as Daniel Moonstar, uh, who were adapted into a, a somewhat semi-successful New Mutants adaptation. It's not bad. It's worth, it's worth watching. But there were some mega bombs as well in the 1980s. Not very well remembered are the adaptation of Howard the Duck, which was huge budget. Uh, George Lucas was involved producing it, and it was a mega flop and so uh, eventually they decided to go more low budget with things like Dolph Lundgren taking over as the Punisher and by the early 1990s it was extremely low budget with uh, versions of Captain America and the Fantastic Four that aren't that well remembered today you have to almost get a bootleg copy of Fantastic Four to see it. It was produced by Roger Corman, who is a B-movie, drive-in movie, drive -in movie uh, legend. And you know the, the results are, are very plainly, obviously, quite cheap, literally. It's been a while since I've seen it. I, I have to see it again to, to weigh in on its aesthetics and its narrative, but it's very cheaply made. And this was Marvel in cinema being overtaken by Superman films, Batman films at uh, DC until Blade comes along in 1998. So you have, again, this, this not that well-known uh, black hero who was in the comics, but wasn't even that well-known by comics readers because he didn't really have his own title very much. But Blade, I remember going to see in the theater and loving it. Fantastic horror action film and was successful enough for Marvel that they were then able to launch the, the MCU uh, eventually after they got into the market with things like Spider-Man and the X-Men films and the, the Hulk movie, which I don't think enough people give enough credit to, but it really was Blade that was the turning point to make Hollywood take note and go, huh, okay, maybe we will green light that X-Men film after all. It was a, a grittier era with characters like Venom and, and Deadpool coming along that thus giving rise to characters like Blade, but eventually you've got the rise of the, the MCU that we all know and love today, in which you've got this rebranding taking place on screen, building this temple franchise. Marvel, in turn, has decided to uh, create more diversity in its characters through an exercise they called All New, All Different, in which new heroes began to take over, like Sam Wilson, the Falcon, taking over as Captain America. Um, as, as you've got Miles Morales, of course, taking over as Spider-Man, Jane Foster taking over as Thor, who is now being introduced into the MCU, and then one of my favorite characters, Kamala Khan, a Muslim teenage superhero taking over as Ms. Marvel. Uh, it's a book that I teach every year in my uh, comic studies class that my students just love. And she is also getting her own uh, series, which my daughter is, is freaking out and can't wait to, uh, to see on Disney+. Plus. So you've got this new commitment at Marvel to diversity with fantastic characters who have then been adapted into films like Spider-Verse with Miles Morales, which I think is one of the greatest comic book movies ever made, period, animated or live action. I think it's, it's absolutely top two or three of greatest comic book movies. And characters like Riri Williams uh, taking over as Iron Man and then getting her own series, Iron Heart. And she's been brought in in various ways to the um, the cartoons um, in the Disney Plus types of shows. And I think there'll be more to come with her. And one of the last frontiers for diversity that Marvel has addressed is queer identity and LGBTQ plus identity in uh, looking at characters brought forth into a series called Marvel Pride, which actually just came out yesterday in comic book stores that I picked up yesterday and I'm only halfway through reading it, but it is phenomenal. If you're interested in uh, how this diversity is now represented in this uh, new way through queer identity in Marvel, this is a great book. You'll have to go to your local comic shop to um, pick up. 
but it is showing that Marvel is finally coming around to uh, allowing everyone and anyone to be a hero and having uh, your own identity represented in a positive way through various heroes who can embody uh, all sorts of different types of identities, not just that male action, sales action uh, type of model of prior decades when comics readership was envisioned in very sort of narrow terms. And now you've got heroes like North Star and Iceman and Wiccan and Hulkling and Dokken uh, being able to showcase uh, queer heroes very prominently, hopefully more prominently in forums such as the MCU in the years ahead with uh, franchises like the Black Panther moving of course into phase four with Disney plus in which you've got Marvel um, moving into what is called transmedia storytelling storytelling across multiple media platforms whereby you are not just watching one type of thing a movie now you are following a narrative across a uh, multiple platforms television with its longer form of storytelling across more hours than what a movie is allows for more depth of characterization to take place in a much more integrated more complex narrative universe to be created as well so i look forward to new shows like ms marvel and uh, oscar isaac starring in moon knight as a way to increase the uh, diversity on screen and allow everyone to have a hero who represents them. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, that was so fascinating and, and interesting, but also just really fun. Um, so we have a bunch of questions that have come through. Um, the first one, um, so someone said, how long did comics cost 10 cents or costing 10 cents last? Um, and can you maybe just speak generally sort of about the pricing structure and, and how that worked? Right. Yeah. So uh, comics started off, as I said, they, they were free once upon a time. And there were different price points that emerged in and around the late 1930s. That 10 cents was um, a, a real, uh, had, had a long run. From about the late 1930s, I've seen things like, you know, action comics costing 10 cents all the way through until around uh, 1960. And then around there, they uh, had a shocking uh, price increase to 12 cents, and then it was 15 cents. So there was a good 20 years of that 10 cents um, uh, price point. Occasionally, some books, if they were more independently published, um, might cost 15 cents be just because it was uh, cost more to make and cost uh, them a little bit more than for their, their price point. But that lasted for quite a while. And then I found through the 1960s, 70s, uh, there were a number of different uh, uh, jumps of, you know, three cents, five cents. They were, it was usually about uh, three, four, five years that they would go and they would tie it to rises in inflation. And occasionally you got an editorial saying, we're sorry, but our costs have increased. And so um, that 10 cents lasted a good 20 years. Uh, if you, today comics cost about $4 each. And if you uh, adjust for inflation, uh, it's many more times over what a 10 cent comic cost proportionately in the in the 1940s comics they cost a lot of money now today unfortunately but uh, the readership is much much smaller i guess so that's why they cost more awesome great question that's a great question yeah um one person asks um the question got moved someone had asked um could you maybe speak a little bit more about the history of wonder woman um wonder woman i know there was tons that we could go through in this presentation but Wonder Woman is a DC character, of course, um, but she is often thought of as the first superheroine, the first female superhero. Uh, many people remember her as such. You'll find books in which she is called that. She is not. Uh, I learned, though, through my research is one of the, the main aspects that I address in a chapter on superheroes in my book, Comic Book Women, that Wonder Woman is a fantastic character, not the first female superhero. Uh, there were uh, characters who had superpowers. There were masked uh, crime fighters. One's called the woman in red. Um, but Wonder Woman was the first uh, uh, prominent female superhero at a major publisher. You had the Silver Scorpion that I mentioned came before Wonder Woman. Actually, Silver Scorpion was 1941, but she didn't last very long. Um, by the end of 1941 into 1942, Wonder Woman comes along uh, first as part of the Justice Society and then gains her own title in Sensation Comics. And she was created by a character called uh, a creator named William William Marston Moulton, I believe. I might be 
than maybe Moulton Marston, but uh, he was uh, as another uh, figure who was very interested in uh, a champion for women in progressive uh, uh, depictions of female identity. He was uh, a proto-feminist, he described himself as, and he was very interested in a powerful woman uh, being able to, uh, to hold her own. Uh, she, he actually didn't write uh, every story. He used ghostwriters, and one of which was uh, an assistant that he had, a woman named Joy Hummel, who actually wrote many of uh, the early Wonder Woman tales and is not really recognized as such. So there was a, a young woman writing these stories and writing this powerful progressive female character who then by the 1950s, the psychiatrist uh, Frederick Wortham says, oh, this is scandalous and this is terrible and, and we must get rid of characters like Wonder Woman. I love the new Wonder Woman films. I wish that there had been a 1940s Wonder Woman adventure serial. It seems like a perfect character to go out and fight crime and punch people with, uh, but they never made one. So Wonder Woman is a vital, important, progressive character uh, often described incorrectly as the first superhero. So interesting. Well, thank you um, for sharing. Um, we have a couple questions about some new characters. So the first is, are more new Marvel characters being created in comics or are they uh, mostly in movies and sort of Disney Plus and some of the um, new uh, mediums? Right. Um, the, I don't, that's a, that's a great question. I don't know that there have been very many new characters created for the MCU. I know uh, Agent Phil Coulson was a new creation for the films, I believe. And I believe on that Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. show, they probably created a bunch of new characters, but the vast majority are all taken from the comics. I know in, in S.H.I.E.L.D. they had characters like Ghost Rider, and I want to say Deathlock was a character. I didn't watch the show beyond the first season, but those are all characters that got their start in the comic books. For the most part, they are usually taking uh, existing characters that have stories that they can then adapt and turn into um, a film. All the film characters uh, definitely taken. There might be some supporting characters like in WandaVision, that agent played by uh, Kat Denning uh, might be a new creation. But as far as the heroes go, um, I can't think off the top of my head of any characters, heroes that were newly created for any of the MCU shows. So they like to take things that have already worked and already have a bit of a fan base or at least images that they can use to market with and hopefully storylines that they can then adapt um, from the comics then into um, the, uh, the, the shows. And there have been numerous new heroes developed uh, in uh, the last sort of 10, 15 years. There's a, a book called The Young Avengers that I hope they do something with, with a, a queer couple, uh, Wiccan and Hulkling, that uh, I hope they then bring into uh, the MCU because I think they would be fantastic. Awesome, well, thank you. Um, on that note, um, one of the questions was, can you speak more about some of the upcoming diversity that we're expecting to see? I know you spoke about um, the new Pride series, um, yeah. some of the new characters, but anything else that you'd have to share? Yeah, absolutely. There is um, uh, more creators of color actually working at uh, Marvel and DC these days. Uh, Saladin Ahmed is a, a Muslim creator who uh, took over uh, the Ms. Marvel series and then went on to write Miles Morales and uh, is the, teasing him as a major project uh, coming up. So, so on the creative side, I've seen more women, just period, writing comics uh, than, than 10 years ago and many more uh, creators of color and um, uh, also a few trans creators as well, cr writing characters from a, a position of, of uh, experience. Let's, let's put it, rather than just the endless amount of white writers writing characters who don't look like themselves. So from that creative standpoint, more uh, creators uh, coming on board to write these projects. And then there have been um, new characters brought on in these legacy types of roles, uh, such as Dokken, who was Wolverine's son, uh, took over for a while. He's a, a queer character in the Marvel Pride series now. Um, and then uh, Wolverine had a I guess a clone daughter, it's hard to explain, but she took over as Wolverine and they're doing things um, with her as well. So uh, they have been creating many new characters outright, uh, but then also bringing in sort of replacement legacy characters and bringing in um, more diverse uh, bodies to uh, become these new super powerful bodies. 
Uh, within the MCU, of course, you've got um, new series like uh, Ms. Marvel, uh, which I can't wait to see. You've got Oscar Isaac as uh, taking over as Moon Knight, who was a white character. And then, of course, you've got uh, Shang-Chi, which um, I, I know there's going to be a sequel uh, for that. So there is this uh, slow push towards bringing in um, a range of different identities to become these heroes who have always sort of been there within the the MCU. They're just moving beyond the um, the A list roster of of white heroes who've been around since the 40s or the 1960s. But they've got a, a wealth of heroes who have been around since the 1970s, um, like Hector Ayala as the the White Tiger, or um, like uh, the the. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Luke Cage and, and Storm and Blade. There's going to be a new Blade film coming up. So these heroes are a natural extension of the, the universe to move towards these somewhat lesser known heroes. But many of them are also um, powerful characters of color who I've got many of them on my bookshelf behind me or, or have a range of stories just waiting to be told. Great question. Yeah. And that was... Um... A, a very interesting and nuanced answer, which um, was awesome. Um, okay. Um, what do you know who the most popular or and or profitable character um, or which character shows up the most? Um, it's typically been uh, like a Wolverine or a Spider-Man in terms of the number of, of titles published. Uh, Spider-Man at one point had four or five different titles being published each month. So he tended to be uh, the number one seller as far as the, the books go. Wolverine was uh, up there as well. But recently, Deadpool has been uh, taking over that role as well with the success of the films. All of a sudden, there were like three or four different Deadpool comics being published each month. And so that you, you see a correlation, I would say, with uh, when a film or a television show comes out and does well, naturally Marvel wants to, to cash in on that success and increases the number of series that are being published. So historically, without uh, the MCU, it was Spider-Man and then Wolverine. Um, but recently, you'll see a shift in if, you know, Falcon takes over as Captain America, you'll see more books about that being published um when deadpool has a new movie come out they'll pump out you know three or four new titles so there is that that correlation to try and appease existing comics fans and then hopefully draw in new readers from those that enjoy the films and want to pick up something new awesome um one question do you know if stan lee and bob kane ever met or collaborated i they did not collaborate. I know that they didn't collaborate directly. Whether they ever met at a party, I suspect that they did. I'd have to look up if if they ever had an official meeting. But the the one uh, fanboy girl uh, type of moment that is actually really weird is that DC Comics actually hired Stan Lee in the late '90s, I want to say, or early 2000s, to re-envision DC's heroes, and it's a subline of books called just imagine stan lee creating dot 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 batman superman this character that character most of them aren't that great but they're fascinating and in one case i believe he re-envisioned batman as a black character i want to say that, it, that he would have envisioned like if i were creating this i would have had this character of color i I want to say it's Batman, but it's been ages since I've read it. But there is some interesting diversity in how Stanley re-envisioned Bob Kane's characters, or at least DC's characters. So, um, yeah, Stanley and Bob Kane. There's an interesting uh, history there in terms of of the the credit that is or is not given to co-creators. Let's put it that way. Awesome. Um, well, I think we'll make this our last question. Of course, we want to be mindful of, of everyone on the call's time and of course your time as well. Um, wait, let's see. Um, can you redefine or kind of clarify for, for the audience what the Bronze Age, the Silver Age, and the Golden Age categorization sort of meant and, and um, their definitions? Yeah, sure. That's a great question. These are um, terms that arose mostly from comic book fans to uh, chronicle different eras of comic book publishing tied in usually with uh, the rise of different types of characters that emerged. Uh, they trace the origins of comic books to the mid-1930s and say that's 
that's when the golden age started. We think of golden age as, as early pioneering when the great stuff debuted. And in comic books, that was sort of the first wave of publishing in which you had a series of, of genres and titles being published. And then, as I said, by the 1950s, superhero titles did decline and there were other genres that replaced them. But then by the late 1950s, there was a rebirth of the Justice League. And then in the early 1960s with Marvel, the new breed of, of heroes came along. And so fans called that the Silver Age because it was a natural sort of turning over of, of types of stories that were being told. And really it's tied to superhero trends ultimately, but uh, there, there's a lot of other genres being published. And then fans began to say, well, what else sort of happens? Well, the 1970s is kind of different than uh, what was going on in the 60s. And it's darker, a little bit grittier, new street level heroes. Let's call that the Bronze Age. So it's comic book fans trying to chart uh, differences in what was going on in comics. And so you see these terms, silver, uh, gold, and bronze in terms of different eras in the 30s to 50s, 60s, and then the late 50s, 60s for silver. Bronze is the 70s. Some people say it's into the 80s. It's hard to say what the, some people uh, have used different terms for um, modern eras. Um, it's, it's kind of fuzzy as to what stops and starts when, but one term that I love is a, um, a recent comic book scholar named Adrian Resha. She has published an article called The Blue Age of Comics and says, we are now in a new era uh, in which we have digital publishing and the, the blue glow off of your tablet that blue hazy glow that the light that won't let you fall asleep at night that we're now in the blue age of uh, comic book reading and that has opened up a whole new market for readers that don't pick up paper copies and often for um, younger women they don't feel comfortable going into a male dominated comic shop male action is sales action right that's the cliche of the comic book industry and now you can instantly access these titles and read them uh, on your own with a blue glow. So apparently we are, I love it. We're now in the blue age of comics. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and I feel as I would be remiss um, if anybody wants to learn more, or of course you were involved in the Museum of Science and Industry exhibit now on Marvel, if someone wants to visit any, any tips or just sharing more information about that exhibit. Yeah, the exhibit is absolutely uh, wonderful. It's fascinating. I learned uh, a lot just as a fan. It is meant uh, for uh, general public who enjoy the films, but also for diehard fans. Uh, and I'm sure many of you are on this uh, call that know the comics inside and out. Even for me, like, oh, well, that's that's fascinating. There's a lot of really uh, great details there. I recommend um, booking your tickets uh, early. I know they've added um, some evening uh, openings, but it has been uh, sold out for a number of, uh, of months now. But uh, I think it's a fantastic exhibit. I've been to many uh, over the years at the MSI, but this one I think is a cut above what they usually do there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This was such a fun way to spend the lunch hour um, and just so interesting and, and, um, and awesome. So thank you so much for joining us to everybody who tuned in today. Thank you all so much for spending your lunch hours with us. Um, the event was recorded, so it will be made available in the next two weeks, oftentimes sooner than that. So um, if you're interested in receiving a copy, you can email us at alumni events at depaul.edu. Um, but other than that, we will wrap it up now for today. Um, but yeah, thank you um, again. And, and thank you all to everyone who joined us. Hopefully we'll see you all soon. Thanks everyone.